Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. This meeting is being recorded. She didn't say that. Why didn't she? This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Thank you. It says, it says, by staying in this meeting, you consent to be recorded. My two options leave meeting, got it. <laughs> what if I just was like, boom, I will not be recorded? Yeah. Well, hi, Cat. Hi, Moose. Cat of the Cat and Moose podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Producer Sarah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one, the only, drum roll, Moose. Moose. There's a lot, you know, I was thinking, you know, I like to write songs lately. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not quite songs. They're more, um, not like, even jingles. Really. I was going to say they're kind of like jingles. What are they if they're not jingles? They're just one liner songs. Mm -hmm. So is that called a, um, I don't know. What would that be called? A hyperbole? I don't know. <laughs> I like that. It's a, it's a hyperbole to music. Um, <laughs> but I got really excited the other day in some odd state that I was in that a lot of fun things rhyme with moose. Oh my gosh. A lot of fun things rhyme with moose. That's awesome. What all did you come up with? Like I immediately think of goose, loose, poos caboose caboose <laughs> i mean i feel like we could do a song i'm not saying now mm -hmm. but you know like the moose is loose in her caboose <laughs> i don't even know what that means yeah that's pretty amazing what is it like to be loose in your caboose moose <laughs> I'll tell you what it's like to be loose in your caboose. It's sort of when your hips don't feel tight mm -hmm. and you can just like slowly do this like, uh, what am I doing right now, Sarah? <laughs> I, yeah, I would say gyrating. <laughs> it's like a, it's a looseness amongst your joints mm -hmm. where you just feel like, oh, I'm loose in my caboose. So I'm going to translate that into body work language just so I can continue to reiterate the knowledge that I have for my own self. So it sounds to me like in your lumbar spine, there is a lot of flexibility and movement and your pelvic floor feels like it can move around <laughs> inside of your hip bones and your ASIS is... is are really nice and flexible and movable. And you probably feel that your upper greater trochanter of your femurs are fitting really nicely into your hip socket. I feel like you just went into the deepest part of your brain and pulled out a bunch of stuff that sounded, I, it sounded right to me. I hope it was right. <laughs> but as you were doing that, I sort of went on my own rabbit trail and I thought, oh my God, moose rhymes with juice. <laughs> and what I thought was, you said that all of my, something about lubrication and my joints and the juice is flowing in the caboose. You know what I mean? The juice is flowing in the caboose, moose, and you sound like Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I mean, we did not even plan that. That <laughs> is freaking audio gold. Sarah, <laughs> sign us up for an audio Grammy. That's right. And you know what? We didn't plan that, and we don't plan any of this. <laughs> no, we got our own notes, and that's all we do. That's all we do. That's all we do. We just cut loose with our notes on the cat and moose. This is going nowhere. I can't think of it. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why we have an editor slash producer named Sarah. Okay, so what do you have to talk about today? Because I have I have a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so unfamiliar. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about our process of how we, what we bring to the podcast and all of that. And like this week I had like probably 
eight, 10 things kind of jotted down, but there's this one giant elephant in the room for me that mm-hmm. I want to talk about, mm-hmm. but I sort of, I, I'm, it's also like a painful thing. So mm-hmm. I'm like, I no, it's not really that painful. Mm-hmm. It's just uncomfortable. Okay. Is this something that you've processed with your therapist yet? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, this is like, it's really, honestly, it's a new hashtag that we have to add to the cat and moose podcast. We always talk about, we're about telling the truth. We're all about, um, you know, we talk about Enneagram, we talk about, uh, therapy, all the different things. I realize that this needs to be another word or phrase that describes the cat and moose podcast. Okay, so before you reveal what it is, because once you reveal it, we're going there, right? Yeah. So yeah. before you reveal what it is, um, I want to tell you... That is what they call a tease, by the <laughs> way. And we're going to loop right on back around. I mean, I am a Scorpio. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I swing my little stinger around. <laughs> you know, can, I want to talk about... Can we come back to uh, horoscopes? Because... Because I, I, I think you have more knowledge than I do. And I have some questions. So, well, it's one of the topics that I have written down to discuss soon. And the reason is, and this is also a tease. If you'd like to envision in your mind's eye, my little scorpion tail swaggering around. (laughs) I can see it. I am having my birth chart read on the 18th of this month by an astrologer. No freaking way. Yes. Can, we, can we record it? I have asked her if I can record it and she has said yes. And can I come and also get mine read? Um, That's probably a possibility. Probably a possibility. That's something parents say when you're like, mom, can I go to the skating rink? <sighs> that's probably a possibility. Uh, yeah. Like here, I need, I need to offer you an apology for that. Um, I agree. I I have been, um, for the past 24 hours, um, kind of in therapy mode. Um, I had a bunch of my, um, body work colleagues over at the house yesterday for, um, Oh yeah. We can talk about that. Um, and, and it was awesome and it had a lot of awesome aspects to it. And, um, I am still kind of like, you know how like Brene Brown says vulnerability hangover, you know, yes, it's like, totally. I feel like I have an active listening hangover. Like, I, <laughs> like, I just feel like I'm still going, that's probably a possibility because what went through my head is I don't want to speak for the woman that she would be willing to do our readings together. Cause I don't know. And I don't know what her boundaries are. And I hate getting boundaries put in front of me cause I feel rejected, you know? And so then I also was like, I don't know if the timing works with your trip that's coming up. And so I gave this really vague diplomatic, very comfortable for everyone answer and just didn't go. Yeah, man. I'm sure she would be <laughs> thrilled to do that. I'll give you her <laughs> number. Okay. Seriously, it would be super cool. Even if we, you know, I, I don't know if that feels like therapy or not, but uh, if, you know, if you're allowed to have other people in the room or not, but it would be amazing for all three of us to get that red and mm. then do a smash up on the podcast. Well, I think that is so fun. I'm going to be in touch with her this afternoon and ask her about that. That is really, really fun. Okay. So tell me what a birth chart, like I've seen, uh, I've been fed the Instagram ads. Um, and there's one, and I guarantee you, we have listeners are going to be like, I have gotten the exact same one. Cause you're as woo woo as we are, <laughs> but it's Drew Barrymore talking about this very specific book mm. that you can have printed. And, mm. you know, you basically give them your birth date. That's it. Mm-hmm. Da da. Yeah. Um, what year and all the things where, in fact, where you were born. Cause mm-hmm. that I've learned that's a piece of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get this actual book that is your birth chart. But I, I'm fascinated that you get to talk to someone about this. Yeah, me too. And I actually haven't seen that ad, but I also haven't opened Instagram in about three months. So that's probably why. <laughs> um, so my understanding is that I gave this person my birth date, my time of birth, and I checked in with my mom to be sure that like I was giving her the exact information and the the city and state, which us being in the U.S., that would make sense. But I guess if you're in another country, it would be the city and then maybe the county or the suburb or the 
village or whatever. Um, so you give the person that and they basically like based on those things, do some sort of triangulation thing and talk about how like, you know, you were born with the moon in your seventh house of Taurus. And that means blah, 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 blah. And one of the things that she said to me, and I was very curious to get your take on this is she said to me, um, she asked me like five different questions, just very simple questions, like a little bit of a bio about myself and and all of that and she said the most important thing that i need to ask you um is do you or do you not believe in reincarnation wow and so to which i said um first of all why is that important and secondly here's what i will say i am more open spiritually and philosophically than i've ever been in my life and I am very open to consider reincarnation being a real thing. I'm very open to that. I don't, I don't swim around in it. I don't study it. I haven't like put a ton of thought into it. And so what I said back to her is I said, well, my mom believes that I am the yellow emperor and the lady at the Nashville crystal store believes that I am also an ancient Chinese healer, like an ancient Chinese medicine man healer. So if that is the case, like maybe, I don't know. And, and I think, and we were texting back and forth and I was trying to be kind of funny and lighthearted because I feel stupid. You know, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I believe, you know, but here are these things that have happened in my life. And she goes, it's very much not about, um, like actual things that have been confirmed or not confirmed. It's your belief level in, are you one and done? Or do you believe that your soul is on a journey? I mean, I want to hold her in my arms, <laughs> rest her head on my chest and just <laughs> rock her very slowly and stare into her eyes because <laughs> yes, my soul is on a journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought, I thought, wow, that, that is really interesting. And then she went on to say, she said, I honor your belief system. And so if you feel like life is one and done, then I frame what I say in a certain way. If you believe that your soul is on a journey, then I frame what I say in other ways. Like I change some of the words and some of the perspectives that I use. And I really appreciated and wanted to like go hold up a picket sign in front of a Baptist church. I really like appreciated that it's like you honor my belief system regardless of your personal bias. Interesting. Because I think I would be annoyed by that. Really? Like the way I take it, and I'm not annoyed by her at all, but like I'm just recognizing what I feel in my body as you're saying all that. And to me, I my thought is I want to be challenged to believe in the openness of what could be. Mm -hmm. So there's part of me that wants her to overlay. My guess is she does believe in reincarnation or that wouldn't be an option is my guess. Well, I, th I think that as an astrologer, it's probably maybe not a prerequisite, but you got to imagine people woo woo enough to go like, Hey, I believe that all this shit like actually influences things and means something. And one of my teachers said something a couple of weeks ago that I thought was really cool. He said, um, for any of those, or he said, for those of you who want to, uh, make fun of astrology, he said, then, then just consider how the moon affects the tide of the oceans. Totally. Exactly. And if the moon affects the tide of the oceans, how does the rotations and the gravity and the spinning around and the elliptical orbits that all the planets make within the uh, galaxy that we're in, within the universe that we're in, like if, if the moon can affect the water on the earth, how do all of those other things not affect us as well? And I just thought, man... I, I haven't really needed like a definitive, like astrology is awesome and not of the devil. I haven't really needed that. And I was really glad that he gave me that because now I'm like, you know what? If my God is not big enough to be able to handle me getting my birth chart read, then I'm worshiping the wrong God. <laughs> well, and hello, if you do believe in God, the idea is that he created all of these things. So why that's the part I've never understood why some people in, you know, westernized religions 
have issues with, you know, wanting to delve into that. Like, Mm -hmm. it it makes no sense to me if you believe, and also why they don't recycle. (laughs) (laughs) Like, if you believe God created all of this, and let's just go down that path, because, you know then why wouldn't you honor it? And how about honoring your temple as well? Ooh, there's one for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So I have a question for you as far as astrology goes and, and having that red, I want to get into the nuance of it for a second. Like my brain immediately goes to like, Oh, she's going to tell you who you were in your past life, mm. but that's not it at all. Right. It's strictly, it's strictly, um, you know, based on this information, this is me reading a chart, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's basically like the way that I look at it and, and I probably shouldn't frame it in a Christian lens, but that is the lens from which I was raised. And what my understanding is, is that she is basically looking at a bunch of data and making an interpretation. You know, just like a pastor might read the Bible and say, this, my people, is what I think this this is telling us, you know. And so there's immediately the opportunity for human error. There's also like immediately the opportunity if we believe that we are comprised of our corporeal soul and the divine and all of that, there is quite a possibility that she's has a unique gift to be able to interpret that in a way that I can't. Right. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to like leave. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't think that I'm going to leave that reading and go make a bunch of changes in my life. I think it's just going to be more of like, instead of your life picture, your soul's picture being like in color, now it's going to be in color and three dimensional. Right. Right. It's sort of like getting um, one of those genealogy tests Mm -hmm. and going like, okay, I knew that I had German and whatever in me, but now I can see like, oh, it's actually Lithuania, not (laughs) Germany. You know, Mm -hmm. like it just helps you go like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. You made me think um, talking about the like, what is it? 23 and me or um, Mm -hmm. what's the other one? The big one. I almost said cemetery.com. Ancestry.com. Ancestry.com. <laughs> yeah, ancestry.com. <laughs> I stumped, and you know how much I love this woman. I stumped my diabetes doctor this week by sharing with her the idea that the human mutation that allowed humans to overcome the bubonic plague was the genesis of juvenile diabetes. Like she did not know that. And I was so proud of myself that I knew something about diabetes that my- every time you say that I'm just like what and I know I've done this before mm-hmm. but remind us the bubonic plague became juvenile diabetes no the bubonic plague <laughs> killed a whole lot of people just like COVID did right and and still is so the bubonic plague was a I don't know what it was a virus or what disease or whatever it was and eventually like when you talk about things like herd immunity and stuff like that eventually the human body adapts to survive and so over the decades that the bubonic plague took place the human body learned this is a bad thing that I don't want to allow. And in order for the body to say, I don't want to allow this. So I have to restructure my makeup in order to keep this thing out. Something else went wrong. And so there's a genetic mutation in the, the humans who developed a resistance to the bubonic plague, the genetic mutation of that is what allowed the pancreas to stop creating insulin. And oh, so if you have juvenile diabetes, you are undoubtedly, you have ancestry from Northern Europe. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, so sounds like time to delve into your topic. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> I, I'm saying interesting because my mom had this uh propensity a blood vessel um situation in her brain that's called moya moya and it's almost it's like 96 percent um within asian ancestry Mm -hmm. and like that always fascinated me because i'm like we just know this much do you know what i mean yeah 
and about ourselves, but also like, how did those, where did those genes come from? You know, like mm-hmm. I have a gene mutation. <laughs> oh my God. Is this, <laughs> is this what our podcast has become? I'm not going to talk about my gene mutation. Wait, actually. why not? Like I, I feel like you've left me hanging and I, I feel certain that some of our listeners feel the same way. I'm thinking of a gene mutation and I immediately <laughs> went to buckle, guess, gap, <laughs> thinking about literally gene. genes. <laughs> no. I have something and honestly, like probably 50% of people have it, 40 or 50%. It's called MTHFR, which that I sounds love. like mother. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's why I love it so much. But it's like a, a way you metabolize things. Anyway. Well, I'm glad that you guys could all learn our medical histories. Um Google it and you'll find our social security numbers on Google. <laughs> yes, and and Moose has a mother f- disease. <laughs> We already knew that, though. My mom knew that at, like, age four. Okay, so, okay, I need to talk to you about something. I'm going to embrace this conversation, and I'm going to breathe down into my hara. Um, okay, so, um, so you know, I'm in Martha Beck land right now because mm-hmm. I'm taking um, some courses from her. And you know how when you find, and I know you know this because I think your, uh, your teachers are this for you. Um, when you find someone that you feel like is on the same plane of what you've always thought, but never had the guts to think, Mm. you know, Mm -hmm. like I look at her teachings and one of the things that she teaches is about socialization. Okay. And, you know, I've, I've never understood exactly what that was. Like, I was like, oh yeah, I get it. You know, peer pressure or whatever to, you know, look and be a certain way. And yet, you know, I've had to unravel over the past few years, like how whooped I am by other people, hmm. which is crazy to me. And most people who know me would be like, who in the world could whoop moose? So when you say whooped, do you mean like, um, do you know that phrase that ends with whooped? Oh yes. And I'm not going to say it and we're not going to say it and we're not going to let our listeners even think about that. So you're just overtaken by it. No, it's not overtaken. It's I let people walk on or no, I let, I make decisions. I'm not letting anyone do anything. It is my, I mean, truly it's me allowing it. Like I'm allowing people to determine my behavior. Um, no, they're not determining it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having a whole <laughs> therapy session over here. I'm not even looking at the screen. I'm like, I do this thing I do in therapy where I stare out the window and try and find a leaf and just like zone in. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you can do it, Moose. You can do it. I believe in you. Oh my God. What I'm trying to say is surprisingly, even though I'm, I'm in Enneagram 8, which by the way, um, awesome Adam wrote in on the uh, text thread and was like, What are these numbers you keep calling each other? Ooh. So, awesome Adam, go check out. Our Enneagram, Our Enneagram series series from last year around this time we recorded it. Um, and it just gives you the nuts and bolts, but I did send him the website to dig in more. So I'm an Enneagram eight, which means I don't let anyone mess with me. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's complete garbage because I go to two in health and I'm super healthy guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're practically like me. <laughs> I know. So Kat is a two. She goes to eight in unhealth. That's why this podcast works. Yin and yang or yang, whichever you prefer. <laughs> I've never thought about that that way. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know I hadn't either. Um, so I go to two in health or whatever. I go to two. It doesn't matter. And two is the people pleasing, like, you naturally want to be wanted and all this crap that I never really thought that I cared about. Hmm. Uh, I don't intellectually really care that much, but when it comes to my business side of things, I can really fall into that where it's like, Oh, whatever, you know, sort of is the easiest path. Let me do that. And I've had to have hard conversations. Listen, I'm not afraid of those. All of this to say from Martha Beck, I'm learning that that is 
our brains create the socialized persona hmm. of us going, our brains are basically Kathy, which you talk about <laughs> as like your critic in some ways. She's a manager type. Uh -huh. Um, but that's like our socialized selves. Like think about it. You walk out the door, you say you're feeling pretty good about yourself. And then the second you hear like, Oh God, these pants are going to make you look fat. You know that you're, that's not your body telling yourself that that is your socialized brain mm. being afraid of showing up. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And so like, I mean, basically what I'm learning is like, I mean, her whole teaching program, her whole coaching program is about like, Hey, I want you to show up not wearing the blazer. Uh, she talks about the story about she had a coaching client come to her uh, office and someone had forgot to put her, someone probably her <laughs> forgot <laughs> to put it on her calendar and she was painting her office and like the person showed up to be coached. And she's like, I'm covered in paint. I look crazy, you know, like this whole thing. And she's like, but I had to go like, I'm still me. Like I, mm. I am still going to show up for this person and be there for this person. Wow. And so much of that has to do with, and she, I'm learning it is being, having integrity in your life. And mm. again, integrity, meaning telling the truth, mm. telling your truth. Yeah. And that doesn't mean spouting it off every chance you get like we do. <laughs> <laughs> you think there's an evolution in that? That could actually be like mature adult communication. That's amazing. Actually, I think what we're doing is exactly what we should be doing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I do. We, we are learning to like be in our bodies and recognize what empowers us and what doesn't. Yeah. And there's this, there's this quote from Martha and it says, no matter how difficult and painful it may be, nothing sounds as good to the soul as truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I say all of this to get to the elephant in the room of the topic that I just can't stop circling. That is our new hashtag for the cat and moose podcast. Okay. And Sarah, if you could give us a drum roll, because this is big. The thing that we are talking about that is the funnel that all of this goes into that we have talked about for the past almost two years is midlife. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because yep. everything that I am reading continues to go back to this idea of our brains start changing at midlife. Like mm. there's actually philosophical and physiological and all these different things that uh, happen at this time in our life. And, and the actual sort of time frame is they say 45 to 64 is what they mm. say. But who, you know, obviously let me tell you, I'm not 45 and I'm full on. Into <laughs> but if we consider that your soul is on a journey, those numbers might shift a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just interesting because like, to me, I, I feel like, you know, I read all these things about midlife crises and stuff. And I, I did that like two years ago. Remember I bought like the Jeep Wrangler for like seven hours. <laughs> yes, I do. And I remember you also, uh, introduced me to Richard Rohr's falling upward. Yes. And it talks about, you know, the second half of life is mm -hmm. what that book talks about. And it's just so interesting because like, there's the obvious things that are happening in our bodies. Like, I feel like when you hit 40, the government should just like start, you know, sending you like a monthly subscription of like joints or something because <laughs> you just need to be able to slow down and breathe through mm -hmm. things. It just feel. Mm -hmm. And here's the reality is like, I don't even have kids, but people my age are, are, you know, somewhere between their kids are like in high school to getting out of college. They're dealing with the empty nest syndrome. For me, I'm dealing with the, oh my God, it, it this, the, you know, I'm so extreme. And then my thinking, like I could be dead any day now. <laughs> right. Right. That, which is the thought that I carry around all the time is, uh, it, am I like, am I done? Like it, it, like it might be that time. And I'll tell you the thing that wounded me, and this is so sad that it was something like this, but in my early studies of becoming a licensed massage therapist, 
um, they had us watch these movies during physiology class and they were these like discovery channel movies about the different systems of the body from like 1982. And it's like, okay, guys, we're in like the 2020s. Like, w- like let's at least update our material. Um, this 1982 movie was of this 45 year old man who was eating a hamburger, smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer, and then went and played football, which he was a dude from England. So it was like soccer. And while he was playing soccer, he clutched his chest and he fell over and he had a heart attack. (laughs) And so ever since seeing that, I mean, I came home and wept that night because I was like, I'm 40 at the time. I was like, I'm 44. That is my next year. Like that's coming. Yeah terrifying i know and and then once you can like breathe through okay but i'm alive now i'll die tomorrow sort of situation (laughs) they're just a little later (laughs) exactly like i'll give myself a year (laughs) even though there's no chronic disease happening at the time um then once you like go like okay i definitely am feeling mortal which Mm -hmm. that's what happens right is like Mm -hmm. 20s and 30s are you kidding me like oh god like I look back and I'm just like, I like cover my mouth in shock of like, wow, (laughs) wow. You really had some fire in your belly. Yeah. But you know, it's like now I feel like I want to make it count. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. And, um, there's this quote, you know, I love a good quote, but there's this book called, um, passion and purpose for the rest of your life by this guy named Dale Hansen Bork is his name. And I was just looking through a bunch of of things this weekend and it said, spend the second half of our lives worrying less about what we do and more about who we become. Man, that's so awesome. It makes me think of a quote that my sister told me just yesterday. And that quote says, you've healed too much to not raise the bar on who has access to your energy. Holy cow. Right. That again. Okay. You've healed too much to not raise the bar on who has access to your energy. Come on. That's incredible. That's so freaking good. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, like there, I I don't know. I just feel like I need to put that out there because I know that we have a ton of listeners who are around the same age as us, but we also have a lot of listeners who are older than us. And I think we have a lot to learn Mm -hmm. from these people because Mm -hmm. they they've been where we are. And I just want to honestly, like, ask our listeners, like, hey, if you're a Patreon or a patron on Patreon, you know, write in and tell us, like, how have you walked through? And so I know there's people younger than us as well. But like, Mm -hmm. as far as midlife goes, I think it's a moment in time. And by moment, I understand it could be long, (laughs) (laughs) but it's a moment in time to, like, really evaluate. Yeah. Is this who I want to be? Is this how I want to operate? Is this the job that I want? You know, like I'm, I am loving learning, uh, for my therapist and other people like, Oh, are you kidding me? I totally, I totally changed jobs at 45 years old or 50 Mm -hmm. years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I love reading those stories of people who are like, like, I just read that this guy, uh, the guy who created Coca-Cola, um, and ruined all of our lives because it's so tasty. (laughs) Um, didn't create it till he was 55 years old. Really? And it's like, yeah. And I, I want to unabashedly be like, okay, my life isn't done. Yeah. I just get to choose. Am I a slave to the man, mm-hmm. whoever the man is, uh, you know, and if you are wanting me to be super PC to the woman, there's nothing about that that feels right in my body. I agree. So screw that. Edit that, Sarah. Take it back. I take it back. Um, but honestly, <laughs> like I just am at a place where I want to fully freaking embrace everything. And I, I want to have the time to do that. And yep. it's interesting because in your twenties and thirties, I remember we all worked our butts off because we were like trying to make it up the ladder. We were mm-hmm. trying to like prove ourselves and just do a great job and you know you know, be creative and all the things. And like, my gosh, we would work till six or seven o'clock at night. And like, it was our lives, you know? And honestly, like, and I know people with kids feel this even more or maybe not more, but feel this because they want to be present with their children at that age. 
And I'm like, man, I want to work, but I also want to travel. And I also Mm -hmm. want to build the things that are my dreams that I sort of neglected or was unaware of at that younger age. Yeah. Well, and and I think something you said, I think on our last episode is, and, and you can correct the quote, but it was something from Martha Beck about leaning into what fascinates you. Yes. Yeah. And I think for me, that's what that feels like. It's like, I go, you know, I, I spent the whole day yesterday working with bodywork practitioners who are studying the same modality that I am. And, and all of them are way more advanced than I am, but I just wanted to sit there in fascination the whole time and ask questions. Why did you do that? Why did you hold that point? Why would large intestine pair with kidney in this particular routine? I don't understand it, you know? And like, I, like time stood still for me. It was just like so fascinating to me. And it's like to be able to take time and space to do the things that that fascinate us and that fulfill us, like what you said about traveling. It's like, do it, do it. We got to do it, everybody. I totally agree. I'm going to Iceland this week. So that's cool. I think that is cool as shit. Can you tell me about like the origins of that trip and what you guys are going to do? Yeah, so it's uh, me and Sarah and Ruthie, and we originally, like back in April when things looked like they were going to open up and there wasn't going to be, you know, all the things. So cute. Um, We, uh, I love Iceland. I was there for about 36 hours on a stopover to Amsterdam one time, and I've always wanted to go back and explore more of the island. And so I was like, Iceland has to be on the trip. And then um, Sarah absolutely loves Amsterdam. And she was like, Amsterdam has to be on the trip. And then my friend Ruthie has been to Copenhagen and loved it. Mm -hmm. So we were like, let's do all three of those countries. And uh, as COVID just started kind of ramping back up, we were like, "Uh, Iceland is like 99% vaccinated. Um, So we just, we, we shortened it to just Iceland. So we're just going to be there for about three and a half days, but I love it and I cannot wait. And I will send lots and lots of pictures. Um, but yeah, it's uh, to your point, like I'm curious for you, um, is your fascination right now just 100% in your body work and, and have you, um, have you narrowed down like your modality? Cause I know you've been doing a ton of different things, but Mm -hmm. do you know, once you do start your practice, like what you're going to focus on? Um, I, I know I have ideas. Um, I don't, I don't want to say that I've, I've narrowed it down even to just body work because I think, I think what a lot of this, um, material has opened up for me and expanded for me is like philosophy and philosophical things and beliefs. And, you know, like you brought up socialization earlier and stuff like that. It's like, I'm, I'm finding myself fascinated in a lot of that stuff. And I think that body work is going to play into whatever the thing is that I'm going to do. And, what is also really interesting to me is that lately I've been trying to like take that 50,000 foot, you know, perspective on my life and go, I'm already incorporating so much of what I've been learning into my life anyway, like into my current job and into the podcast and into my relationships and my understanding of the internal family system and, and all of that. And so it's like, I think I'm going to do my best at least for the time being. And I'm not trying to not answer your question, but I'm going to just try to be where my feet are, you know? No, I think that's fantastic because you're, you know, you're on the path. Uh, Here's how I picture it. You remember the small world ride down at Walt Disney world? Uh Uh-huh. It's like a little outdated, and oh, by yeah. a little, I mean a lot. Yeah. But there is something amazing when you get on that, how simplistic life feels, yes. where you're just like, it's a small world after all. It's a sm-. And you're like, this is like creepy animatronic <laughs> stuff from the 60s. However, I feel at home here. Yes. And I feel like we're on that ride. (laughs) And, you know, we're kind of looking at each other like, is this a horror movie or is this as good as it could be? Because this feels kind of nice. And we just are there for the ride. You know, like Uh we we got on. We decided to get on the ride and pull the bar down. And the bar fit. Thank God the bar fit. (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank God it did. There's some rides you get on, and that thing does not snap down. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? I know what you're saying, and then you get invited to get off the ride, which is a <laughs> horrible, horrible experience. Or a huge blessing, because you were on the wrong ride. I right. don't know if you're following us, but this is a metaphor for your life. Yeah. <laughs> I was just and say. we need you to get on the small world ride and just <laughs> let it be what it is. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. That is awesome. So if you, seriously, if you are a listener and you're like, okay, I am feeling what you're feeling. I'm not in midlife exactly, but I know what you mean where right now something feels off, but I feel I'm fascinated with this thing over there. Wouldn't it be amazing to do just a shorty? We used to do these shorties that we dropped on Fridays. Wouldn't it be cool if people called in to the one 866 K A T M O O five. Uh, and if you, if that number is too stressful for you, you should have it programmed into your phone. But if you don't, and you're a very bad listener, you can go to catmoosepodcast.com. <laughs> All the details are there, but it would be so cool to have audio from our listeners saying like, I am feeling this too. Mm-hmm. And here, here's my first step onto that new path. Mm. I am too. Cause that, you know, we talked about Martha Beck talking about one degree turns change yep. everything if yep. you keep making them. Yeah. And it's like, you know, for me, you know, the goals I want around my body, like for me, I'm just doing one step at a time. That means taking care of myself. Sometimes that's flossing my teeth when I never floss <laughs> I, and I'm choosing to do that. Sometimes it's going outside and being in the sun so I can get my vitamin D but like we have to choose those things for ourselves. Otherwise yeah. we wake up one day and we've neglected ourselves for years. Right. And to your point from a couple of episodes ago that, that Brene Brown said there are consequences to that. That's right. You know, right. which is where I tend to hang out a little bit too long. Cause then I become anxious and worried. Um, but yeah, it's like make the the one degree shift. I remember my therapist saying to me probably about a year ago, she said, if you stopped doing the work, if you stopped going to therapy, if you stopped studying body work and exploring how your body has its own wisdom and all of that, she goes, it would be enough. Wow. And so it's like, okay, yes, it would be enough. And I want to keep making the one degree turns. I want to keep doing the work. I want to get better and healthier and smarter and, and more awesome so that I can give back to other humans. You know, it's like if, if I learn about this, like healing art stuff and can help people through some of these hard times in life that I myself am experiencing right now, then party on. I know. And it can be such a scary thing sometimes though, because like, mm-hmm. I feel like when you're face to face with, and and I want, I want to change kind of the language I'm using based on what you just said. Like I literally was like, get on the path, take a step. Sometimes it's not that big of a step. It just feels that way. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I mean, I'll be honest, like during 2020, like I, as I've talked about, I've gained a lot of weight. I mean, it's hard for me to freaking show up to Mm -hmm. some meeting sometimes because I'm like, oh my God, I was with an artist last week that I hadn't seen in two years. It had been Mm -hmm. that long. Mm -hmm. And he asked to go and and meet and have a conversation. And, and I sat down with him and I mean, the whole way there, I was just like, I know I've gained so much weight and And then I was like, you know what? I am still as good of a person. I'm still making my way. Sometimes it's just showing up, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example. I wasn't going to bring this up cause it's very freaking vulnerable, but I got an email on Friday saying that I had passed the first phase of, um, being accepted into the counseling program at UC Denver. Ah, that's amazing. But I have to go through a group interview. Ooh, wow. <laughs> like, like straight up, I haven't had to interview. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think. Since 2008, I have not had to actually interview with something on the line since 2008. That's amazing. And the beautiful thing is, is you are a great coach. You like teach people how to interview well, (laughs) you know, like if you think about your artist and them doing interviews on the radio and stuff like that, it's like, you are like already like the masterclass teacher on interviewing. 
I know, but that's where like, you know, it's, it's sort of where the rubber meets the road where you're like, so the way I kind of went into all this is like, okay, I'm just going to keep stepping through open doors Mm -hmm. as it relates to that. Since then, I'm now in a coaching program that has its own set of uh, financial (laughs) things and, you know, time I have to put aside to study. And then this comes along and I'm like, oh, I promised myself I would step through the doors. But sitting there and thinking about like a room full of professors (laughs) interviewing me, Mm -hmm. you know what my first thought was? And it goes back to Martha and her socialization was, oh, my gosh, I have to study, study, study in order to sound smart in front of them. And it was so funny because after I felt that I went and I was doing some of my homework um, and Martha was doing this video talking about, I love that she's just on a first name basis with us Uh now. Her, her partner calls her Marty. So maybe we can just change it to Marty. (laughs) Um, But anyway, like she talked about specifically how, you know, we don't have to look the part. It's okay. Mm-hmm. as long. I mean, obviously I want to look professional. I'm not saying that, but my nature is to cram and crash. And my old therapist told me this, she's like, you over prepare. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wait a minute, I'm going into this to learn. I don't have to prove to them that I know what I'm doing. I right. have to prove to them. I care enough mm-hmm. to do the work. Mm-hmm. You have to show up and be you. Right. Like you have to show up and be you. That is intimidating. And as someone who experiences you, while you might find that intimidating, I find that to be like fairy dust floating around in the clouds full of Inya sounding awesomeness. You know what I'm saying? It's like you are a really wonderful, amazing human being. And all you have to do is be you. You're going to absolutely slay that. I know. And it it has taken me truly 43 years to understand what you just described (laughs) and not having I mean, where are my Enneagram threes at? And look, I know I'm, I'm y'all just got to go study the Enneagram if you're going to listen to this podcast. Yeah. My Enneagram threes get what I'm saying. It's this idea of what do I need to shape shift in yep. order to be received and loved and appreciated. Yeah. I'm, I'm envisioning all my Enneagram threes in my life and I'm like, yep, yep, yep. And that's my wing. So like, hello. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. And it's such, and we all do it, but I mean, Enneagram threes, this is like a, a momentary thing for them sometimes. And not that they can't work it out. They can, but yes, to be able to go, Oh my God, I have an invitation to step into something that could revolutionize my heart. Mm -hmm. Forget my career. (laughs) Right. How Mm -hmm. about that? Like Mm -hmm. revolutionize my heart and give me the tools to help other people, which is Mm -hmm. really all I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I am going to consider not showing up on a zoom because I'm afraid I won't be received. Right. That's what I'm walking through. Just hearing you say that, it sounds so ridiculous and so real. Right. And I think even maybe considering saying that in your interview, you wow, know, it's like that it's, it's, it's that kind of stuff that I think it's like you being your truest self, you having the way of integrity, like you showing up and being your authentic self is exactly what those people need to see. Dang. It's exactly what they need to see. And I want you to bring it. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do it now. Good. But here's the deal. This is where we self-sabotage. I think (laughs) it is so easy to be like, Oh God, I got that email who like my nature has been, you know, like I I haven't really shared it with anyone because it feels so weighty. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm like, if that were you, I would be like, Oh, 
right now, open up the email. You're <laughs> writing them back. You're accepting the interview. Yes. If it doesn't work out, it wasn't meant to work out, but you sure as hell are going to get on yes. that freaking small world train. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Hop on to the 60s mechanical small world utopia. <laughs> Oh, you are Help going us. to do so great. And if you haven't accepted that, it needs to be done today. I haven't. Like today. Okay. I will text you once it is complete. Okay, good. That makes me so happy. <sighs> I have a question for you about Enneagram 8s real quick. Okay. I have been curious about, um, I know my therapist Enneagram type, um, my body work practitioner, I don't know her type and I've been curious about it, but not wanting to just like ask her directly because I feel like she would say something like, what does that have to do with what's going on in your body? Nothing. Totally. And so, right. um, and so I, I don't really want to do that. And so I do have a question for you since you are an eight, um, how important is justice to you? I believe it's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like felt that in my body before I felt it anywhere else. I mean, Enneagram eights and ones, we're very justice driven. Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. I, I thought that that was the case. And I thought to myself, do I have another eight in my life? I mean, it's possible. Listen, strong personalities attract strong personalities. So, oh, man. I mean, yeah, as far as like how that plays out, um, eights, I would say, can lean to, you know, we're against before we're for things. <laughs> um, so it's often the justice isn't just some grand scheme of justice. Like that is for sure. And that kind of depends on your instinct as well. Like I'm a social instinct. So my nature is to see it from a very grand view of like, you know, um, immigration or, mm -hmm. you know, all the different things that could be really big things. I think there should be justice, but, um, but on an individual level, often we make up stories that of like, Oh, someone is invading my space because we go to five mm -hmm. and we have giant walls around us and all the things. And so there is justice to the protection of ourselves. Hmm. Got you. And yeah. then, so, and, and then on the healthy side, you go to two, which is like the helper. This is making a lot of sense to me. I think I have, I think I have another, another eight in my life. It wouldn't shock me. It wouldn't shock me, man. What are you guys doing to me? <laughs> we're making you work for the connection that's what we're doing <laughs> especially for a two to have to climb over those walls you know listen there isn't another type on the enneagram that would take the time to scale that wall that a two would <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. And the thing that I learned, though, I learned this in class the other day, is that if you push on or break through someone's boundaries, then it is likely that they will resent you. Oh, well, it depends. So do you scale the wall or do you just go, no, nah, man, I'll just stand back over here. It's yeah, I, I don't think you scale the wall until you <laughs> have gotten the wink before you scale the wall. Oh, Because we, we do like to be met with the same energy. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you right now, there's a handful of people who have thought it was OK to <laughs> scale that wall and they got shot. <laughs> <laughs> they got shot crossing the border. That's amazing. You're like, no, I don't resent you because you're dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I believe I'm strong. I'm a strong advocate for immigration, except when it's my borders. <laughs> and then I need to see your passport, please. <laughs> And you're not talking about your borders being your country's borders. You're talking about your my border. Walls. <laughs> yeah. My giant castle on the hill with like, you know, I've, I've got like 10 levels of boundaries, you know, like people will be like, oh, I made it to the, I made it to the walls of Moose's castle. And it's like, oh, honey, there's like. <laughs> There's like 10 different sets of wild animals ready to <laughs> right. rip the, you apart. Right, There's the girl with the bloody yes. eyes that will come at you. 
<laughs> and there's the moat and there's the drawbridge and then there's yeah. seven more walls. <laughs> yeah. And and how does your castle look? I'm just curious. Like, does it have a party in the front? Like, is it is it are there signs up saying like turn here for connection? <laughs> Like, talk to me. Like, is it just uh, hearts everywhere? I I don't know. That feels, like, really girly to me. Like, all that okay, feels they, real... Okay, they can be, like, black hearts. I'm just no, asking like how you're either. drawing people into your farm that has a castle. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I know that there's a freaking, like, there's, like, a picking party. Yeah. But then that kind of <laughs> feels like a seven. Um, What are my walls like? Um, My... <laughs> Okay, here are my walls. My okay. walls are like, what walls? There aren't any walls. And then you get inside and I throw the walls up and I'm like, why the fuck are you in here? Yeah, yeah. Why are you in here? Yeah. Because like now you make my life hell. And like in it, like, and I love it kind of like with that same like energy. It's like, I love it and I hate it. You know, it's like the eights that I have in my life have challenged me so hard and made me so mad. And I am so grateful. <laughs> like I'm so, so, so grateful. Oh, totally. We're, we're freaking amazing. You are amazing. Like, we, we are incredible. You but are. You, yeah. Yours is more like a field. And you're, you're butt naked and you're just like, you're sorry, but you are. Why am I always naked or leading with my pelvis or like whatever? Because you're a Scorpio. <laughs> I just don't want to. I think your instinct, I think you're an Enneagram two with a one-to-one -one or a sexual instinct. I a hundred percent think that. Okay. Because you love to like a vampire you want to sink your teeth into the neck oh of whoever it is with you not sexually and just feel that connection and blood in your veins and then you want to go home and take a nap <laughs> okay <laughs> It's true. And, and, but you're right. Like you, it, it kind of has to be on your terms. Right. I, I was going to say like, I, I'm not like, I'm not unpicky. Like I'm, right, exactly. I'm pretty, I've, I've got some opinions for sure. I'm not, like, yeah. you know, one to be steamrolled. I think you're more like a nudist colony that has an application process. <laughs> I think where I'm getting really hung up in this discussion is the idea of nakedness, because that does not that does not feel like freedom to me. Like that makes me it just feel like I don't want anybody to see that. <laughs> like I don't well, want anybody but it's a application or not for your insides being open. It's just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you actually want to run around naked, mm -hmm. but you do want access to people's hearts. Hmm. I don't feel like it's, I don't feel like it's with like bad intent though. I, I don't think it is at all. Okay, good. Yeah. I mean, I could totally see you like, I, I picture a bunch of like a zoom call with a bunch of people on there all naked and you're naked as well. And you have like a clipboard, but your clipboard's covering your top areas. <laughs> so you can't really see you're naked. It's just like a hint. And you're inner, you are the interviewee that I'm about to walk in on. And you're asking them like, hey, this is a really special place where there's going to be connection. But I need to make sure you're not crazy. Yeah. Like you yeah. definitely have a crazy meter too. Yeah, I do have a crazy meter. Thank God. <laughs> do you know the phrase my mom used to say? I think you do. She would say, uh, where the light is brighter, the bugs are bigger. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes you got to take that spotlight and turn it off because people can see it and they will come a running. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Special thanks to our producer, Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Production.